Okay. Um, just stop me any time it, it goes out. Okay, but the yeah, because you're saying so many interesting things that I don't want them to be lost. Oh, okay. So I'll back up here just a second. A painter is alone in his or her studio with a vision that's in one's mind, and we, we take it from our mind and we put it through the chemistry of the, the oils onto the, the canvas. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, a painter wants to go to the next level, where the painter wants to see that image moving. Mm-hmm. So the next step would be filmography. So um, oftentimes, if you look at a film director, he or she had been a painter in earlier uh, part of their career. Now we see lots of graphic designers going into animation because you want to see that image move. Um, so it's, an, it's a natural ne- uh, progression to want to see that image that we portray that comes from the mind into the canvas move and even talk and communicate with an audience. So that is a natural progression. Along with that, part of the progression is having a, a theoretical viewpoint to having a message that one wants to um, state. So rather than being a stoic painter, the more performance artist in me took over. And performance art is certainly based on happenings and capro and whatnot, but the performance artist is performing because he or she has a message, and it's usually sociopolitical. Most performance artists have um, had an ideology that wanted to spread or, or cause some kind of ludic or irony on society to do a happening in the middle of nowhere, like in the Grand Central Station in New York or in an alleyway. But um, once uh, multimedia started becoming more important for artists to document our work, we started going more into the written word and writing more manifestos and actually lyricizing our, our paintings. So it's a natural progression. Now, as far as I'm concerned, uh, when I got into transhumanism, meaning human enhancement and radical life extension, it seemed almost um, paramount to to have a vision that is expressed in words. Um, and along with that comes activism. If you're an activist, you've got to speak up and, and say what you believe in. So it seemed a natural course for me to go from the, the image and the silence of the image to through performance, through becoming more philosophically inclined in addressing some of the issues that face us today as a human species. I think it's definitely providing a much fuller and complete picture and and and, and the whole spectrum of, of of, of completeness, both on the emotional end and on the sort of logical, uh, mm, logical, hardcore thinking end. But that's the rarity of, of your case, I think, because usually most people are either very logical and uh, very not artistic, like, for example, me, or very artistic and not so logical, right? And yet you're one of those rare cases who's combining both, which is, which is really interesting, I think. So, so let's, let's move on along your story then. Um, so then you start being involved into issues of transhumanism and radical life extension and the philosophy behind those. Um, what is your motivation? Uh, first of all, let's, let's break it down like this. So what is your work? What's the essence of your work nowadays? What do you do exactly? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. What I'm doing right at this moment is I have a rose garden. I've uh, become a, a bit of a, um, a connoisseur, I suppose, an amateur connoisseur of uh, plants. I, in this particular house that we built, I planted 28 trees, a number of bushes. I have a rose garden with seven different species, and I just started a, a bamboo garden. So I suppose that that's part biological art if you want to look at it that way as a field. Um, But more seriously, based on my particular practice, I have been working with a design called Primo Post Human for the past 10 years, and I keep on reinventing it. Um, As agreeing with Kevin Kelly, we're a process, we're a work in progress. So uh, so to our, our, our ideas. And as an artist, my practice keeps on growing. Uh, Primo Post Human, as the, um, the original future human prototype, needs to keep on evolving because the technology keeps on evolving and the sciences, as well as the ethical issues and the, the ideology and the uh, issue of um, 
stem cell cloning and genetic engineering and who are we in identity and all the uh, philosophical rigmarole around it. So I, I still am with Prima Posthuman. I'm looking at new stages of it and trying to um, create it as a, a narrative for uh, humans to understand rather than making it so totally cyborg-esque, which is a bit of a turn-off when we, we think of the cyborg being metal human. I'd rather it be humaneness uh, transhuman towards posthuman. I'm also very interested in working in um, the area of uploads, which is substrate independent minds, or another term is whole brain emulation. So I'm doing a, a fair amount of research in that area and considering how that fits into human enhancement and how that fits into my primo posthuman design. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm also continuing to work in bio arts or biological arts. I did a project called um, Bone Density uh, last year um, based on my bone density and reversing bone loss. Uh, most women and men would be interested in that project. And currently the project is um, neurotransmitters, working with my brain and taking a look at some of the degeneration in my brain or the white matter that we really don't want too much of. But most of it is a natural process of aging. So I'm looking at not tremendously reversing that because that would be impossible and if I knew how to do it I'd be a multi-billionaire <laughs> but um, so I'm, I'm looking at what sciences and technologies and advances are coming about that would help us keep the plasticity of our thinking of our cognitive capabilities going so plasticity is important there as well as um, looking at MRIs of the brain and considering what um, um, methodology to use to try to increase the dopamine in the brain, to um, look at serotonin uptake inhibitors, of course, mm-hmm. but to increase the plasticity. So, so let me ask you this then. You have such a diverse background. You have a s- whole spectrum of interests from rose gardening to uh, white matter in the brain to uh, enhancing the human body and radical life extension to art. Uh, so who is Natasha Vitamur then? Are you an artist? Are you a philosopher? Are you an academic? Are you an AI researcher? Are you, wh- wh- how do you see yourself primarily? You know, it's interesting. I really don't see myself as an artist anymore. I, you know, when, and, I think when, when people think of the term artist, they associate it with a painting hanging on the wall. And while painting is fun, like the painting behind me, I enjoy doing that, and I enjoy doing large paintings for my home. But um, I, I suppose I'm more of a... Um, I don't know what I am anymore. <laughs> I, maybe I'm in a new meant. field that isn't defined yet. Maybe it's... Um, I'm a cross disciplinaritarian or a transdisciplinarian of um, the sciences, technologies and, and media art. I'm I okay, I'm a designer. I think that says it all because if you're a designer, you have you're skilled in the arts. You understand uh, the practicality of the arts. Um, Sorry, I lost the sound there again. Oh okay, is this better now? No. Okay. Yeah, back, back, okay. Back. So, um, I suppose I'm a designer because design incorporates arts, the fine arts, uh, and the sensibility and, and the, all the different art theories. And it also incorporates science. So design has to be based on solving a problem. And where art, per se, doesn't have to solve a problem. Yeah. Uh, and I'm more interested at this point in my life in, in problem solving. So I would have to say I am a designer. So that's a rather engineering approach, wouldn't you say? Because engineers are problem solvers, right? You have a a river and you need to find the best way of crossing it and you build a bridge and you solve the problem. So you have the problem of death, for example. Then you're looking into radical life extension technologies or aging, as you've mentioned before, and all kinds of ways to, at the very least, slow aging if not defeat it. So isn't that a very engineering approach? Yes, I, I, but I think that engineers would probably be offended a little bit to think that an artist who is a designer would assume that he or she is an engineer because, remember, engineering is based on mathematics. And uh, like architecture is based on mathematics. 
Mathematics and I are not good bed partners. I am slightly dyslexic, and when I have to do math, I one, two, three. I, I'm counting on my fingers, so it's. Um, I don't have that aptitude for math, so I'm not an engineer. Um, whereas a designer is uh, deals with. Um, you don't have to know math, but you do have to know the coordinates of design, and you're looking at um, the bigger picture. Uh, a bigger picture, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, like Bucky Fuller, who was an architect, yeah. was a um, an astute uh, designer because he understood the world game plan. He understood what was the problem in the world and sought to uh, solve that problem. And at his time, the problem was distribution of foods. So he went about to develop the world game plan to, to solve that problem, which mm-hmm. unfortunately, uh, government um, and... Um, Big business or whatever uh, didn't have, hold that in high regard. So we still have our problem with distribution of food to the pe- many people in the world who need food and water, which is very sad. But um, so I think design is is probably the area where I fit best.